Hello everyone, Adam here and welcome to the fourth Gameplay Review UK Community Challenge video of 2020. Last month's challenge was to build an aircraft from the 1930s. Being mindful that the latter part of this video would focus on aircraft that were available at the start of World War II. The response I had was amazing. I can't wait to go through all of the submissions with you folks. As per usual, I will go through the aircraft in order of their first flights, but keep in mind some of the submissions are of later variants, so the timelines will start to overlap a little. The first aircraft on the list is the Boeing P-26 Pea Shooter, and it was the first American all-metal production fighter aircraft. This Kerbal Space Program replica was created by Danafin and I think it's a perfect aircraft to start the episode off with for two reasons. Firstly, this plane first flew on the 20th of March 1932, making it the oldest aircraft featured in this episode. And thanks to Danafin's great detailing here, you can still see traits in the aircraft inherited from the previous decades. Secondly, although it was considered obsolete by the time the Second World War broke out, it would still serve and even engage in combat during the conflict. Captain Villamore's squadron even managed to shoot down some Mitsubishi Zeros despite the aircraft being massively outclassed by Zero. We will put aircraft aside for a moment to see what developments were taking place in rockets technology. Apoapsis Gaming has sent in his awesome recreation of the GERD X, which was a prototype rocket built by the group for the study of reactive motion. This was a Soviet research bureau set up to research various aspects of rocketry. For me, the most noteworthy member was a man named Sergei Korolev. Later, he would lead the Soviet space program and eventually be responsible for launching the first satellite into orbit. For now, keep in mind Sputnik is still about 25 years away you can see Sergei still has a lot of work ahead of him. Though I know the rocket was bench tested to reach over 5 kilometers in altitude, I'm not sure if it's ever flew. In comparison, Apoapsis is over 20 meters tall and can just about reach low carbon orbit, so it is a perfect craft to try if you are practicing efficient orbital launch profiles. Moving back to planes here, and we see just a Dutch guy's replica of the Lockheed Model 10 Electra. It first flew February the 23rd, 1934, and was introduced the following year. The aircraft is famous for being flown by Amelia Earhart on her ill-fated Around the World expedition in 1937, in which she disappeared somewhere on the leg between Papua New Guinea and Hawaii. Like most of Just the Dutch Guy's craft, the replica has very similar handling and performance to the real article, and so is a great way to get a good feel for an aircraft. He also goes out of his way to limit part count and weight. He mostly builds his craft live on Twitch, and has recently hit over 1,000 subscribers. Well done for that, mate. Next, we have one of the most detailed replicas I have seen so far in this series, Servos PBY. Catalina. Not only does this craft look the part, Servo has included everything you want, from engine startup sequencing to a full complement of custom landing gear. Just a fantastic job all round. The Catalina first flew on the 28th of March 1935, and even though it would mostly be utilised for military service over the next two decades, and considered retired by the late 50s, the last military variants were still being used up until the 1980s. Even to this day, many are still airworthy and are often used as water tankers to help fight wildfires. Put simply, this is a beautiful replica of a beautiful craft. Next, we have another iconic aircraft also built by Servo the Messerschmitt 109. Its first flight was on the 9th of May 1935, 
and first saw action in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. It was one of the most advanced fighters when it first appeared, and Servo has made this craft so well that it kind of speaks for itself. The speed, handling, climb rate and max flight ceiling surpass pretty much all of the other aircraft we've featured so far in this series, and it's not surprising that this aircraft would form the backbone of the Luftwaffe's fighting force up until the start of the jet age. At the same time as the 109 was in production, the Luftwaffe had also started to fly the Junkers 87 Stuka. This aircraft was a rather effective dive bomber, which also made its combat debut in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. From the offset, Stukas were mostly considered sitting ducks by enemy fighters, but when supported by 109s, their effects could be devastating. The Stuka is also famous for its early versions featuring sirens, which would wind up upon entering a dive. Initially, this noise could be quite terrifying for any potential target, but before long they become nothing more than an early warning sign, so were removed. The Stuka had a mechanism that could help its bomb payload clear the aircraft and waft from its propellers, which Kami Killer has totally nailed. Amazing work there. Also note, I've removed the cannons, Kami included, but more on that in the next episode. Next we have a Morana Sony MS-406, recreated by Mopori. Its first flight was 8th of August 1935, was fully introduced in 1938, and had entered service in the French Air Force by 1939. It was France's most numerous fighter during the Second World War, and at the beginning of the war, it was only one of two French-built aircraft capable of reaching 400 km an hour. During the Phony War, these aircraft were capable of holding their own, however, upon the invasion of France in May 1940, over 400 of these aircraft would fall prey to the Nazi Blitzkrieg, perfectly demonstrating how the aircraft and tactics employed just before the outbreak of World War II very quickly became obsolete during the conflict. Big thanks to Mopori for making such a quintessential aircraft for the episode. I'll also add I love how Mopori has incorporated custom control surfaces onto the craft to complete the aesthetic. We also have a Supermarine Spitfire to show you, unofficially submitted by Mill. Good thing I spotted this on our Discord. I was surprised to see a lack of British aircraft, so I'm glad I caught this gem of a craft file. The Spitfire first flew on the 5th of March 1936 and was designed as a short-range high-performance interceptor aircraft. Many variants of the Spitfire were built using several wing configurations and it was produced in greater numbers than any other British aircraft. It is a treasured icon of the Battle of Britain even to this day and has over 60 working models still being maintained. Just note that Milk has recreated a Mark 14 version of the Spitfire, which didn't really see action until about 1944, so we'll save that for the next episode too. Let's jump back over to rocket development for a moment and check out the next iteration of Goddard rockets. This one is the L-13 and was submitted by Spacelab. It was launched on the 26th of March 1937 and reached an altitude of 1.7 miles. Like Apoapsis's rocket, Spacelab's rocket is also much larger than its real-life counterpart in order to add more details. And if you look closely, you can see that Spacelab has made the most of it and added a lot of fine details. Here we see a Barclay Bro T8P1, and it was created by Xenome. This is a great choice from Xenome, submitting an aircraft that looks so typical for the era, but one that I know very little about. It first flew in April 1937. The TAP meant it could transport 8 passengers, and it was designed to be simple and rugged. Only 11 of these aircraft were ever built due to low interest. It seems as though by this point in time, fixed geared aircraft like the T-8P-1 were falling out of favour. One was used by America's military's Arctic forces, 
but most were sold to Canada to be used as bush planes. Now we have another craft from Just a Dutch Guy, the Piper J3 Cub. It's an American light aircraft that was built between 1938 and 1947. The aircraft suits Just a Dutch Guy's build style down to the ground. It has a simple, lightweight design, which gives good low speed handling properties and short field performance. The Cub is Piper Aircraft's most produced model, with nearly 20,000 built in the United States. Due to its performance, it was well suited for a variety of military uses too, such as reconnaissance, liaison and ground control. Many Cubs are still flying today. Notably, Cubs are highly prized as bush aircraft. Now we move on to the Boeing 314 Clipper. This monster of a craft was sent in to us by Holiday the Leak. Due to the part count, and hence low frame rate, it's hard for me to show off the craft to its full extent, but I think you can see just from this that it is an incredibly well made build. The Clipper was a United States long range flying boat produced by Boeing between 1938 and 1941. One of the largest aircraft of its time, it used the massive wings of Boeing's earlier XB-15 bomber prototype to achieve the range necessary for flights across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. In comparison to the other craft seen so far in this series, the Clipper could accommodate over 80 passengers, including crew. The last Pan Am owned 314 was retired by 1946, but it had managed to accumulate more than a million flight miles. The next craft on the list was also sent in by Holiday, the infamous Mitsubishi A6M Zero. The Zero first flew on the 1st of April 1939. The Zero is considered to have been the most capable carrier based fighter in the world when it was introduced early in World War II, combining excellent maneuverability and range. There is a lot I could mention about this aircraft, but since this variant was used during the start of the next decade, I will save it for the next episode. Lastly, we see the B-24 Liberator, made by Phantom Aerospace. First, we'll take a look at the craft and how it was sent in. Phantom has made this totally from stock, including some Kraken Tech engines for propulsion. On top of this, the craft is incredibly detailed and really nice to fly. In fact, it was so easy that I had spare time to mess about with the craft, so I experimented with some braking ground propellers and made it so the dorsal turret could rotate. I mostly did that for fun, but since this is the last aircraft of the episode, I thought it would be good to focus on the types of armaments that would become standard moving on to the next decade. You can see that this aircraft was built just in the nick of time. Asia was at war, Europe was descending into it, and before long America would also be dragged into the fray. The largest conflict in world history was about to begin, the conflict known as the Second World War. Join us next time when we will see how these aircraft fared during World War II, what aircraft would be produced in order to counter them, and how this would propel the world into the modern jet age. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. I really appreciate it. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank anyone who uploaded their craft to me this month. I think you can tell that the quality of the builds are getting better month on month and it's really exciting to see the change and the development in certain people. You might have noticed that everyone on the list this month has pretty much ended up as a captain so well done to all of you guys and anyone who's watching who also thinks they're good at creating Kerbal Space Program craft files please do join our Discord and send yours in to us for the next video.
I'll also like to take this opportunity to plug my new YouTube membership feature. Please do consider joining as I would love to see people being able to use our community emojis and show off their group community badges, especially for the premieres in the comments section of this series. I'll add some links to my new membership video. Please do check it out. Even if you don't intend to officially join, I made it in the hope my usual subscribers would still enjoy it. Before I go, I would like to take the time to give an extra shout out to my Patreons and YouTube members. It is thanks to you guys that I am able to put in the extra effort this content deserves. So if you like my channel and this series, remember, we also have them to thank for it. So thank you for your support. Thanks again to those who submitted craft for this video, and thank you for watching. See you next time.